This is off planet radio. Hello and welcome once again to Off Planet Radio. I'm Randy Moggins, and uh, one of the joys of doing the show is that I get to talk to very interesting people, people who become friends and colleagues and allies, and uh, I really sometimes really value the things that I talk about off air and try to migrate them into the show. And my guest today comes with um, a very interesting and touching personal story as well as a background um, in the arts, which is just so important right now that um, we're joining forces with artistic people. That's, that's been a vision that we have on Off Planet Radio. Emily and I have talked about this and tried to act on it as much as possible to bring the arts forward and to coalesce people from their higher forms and ranges of thinking and expression. And so today's guest comes to us um, from, I guess, the Pacific Northwest Canada. And um, she'll tell you a little bit more about that. She is a voiceover artist, singer, songwriter, musician, self-producing musician, and uh, a graphic artist as well, who puts out some very interesting stuff. And I want to introduce you all to Holly Linden. I love saying your name. Really? Oh, good. Hi, Holly Randy. Linden. It sounds so happy. <laughs> the first time I heard it, it's musical. The, the name is musical itself. Yeah, make all the L's the la-la-la sound. Yeah, yeah. It, it's, it, it lets you really work your tongue when you're saying it. Yeah. <laughs> so, welcome to the show, Holly. Um, it's Thank great you. to have you on. And uh, we're going to go through some things here. Um, Maybe we begin by telling people a little bit of what you want to leave about your background. I sort of introduced you with a rough sketch. Mm. Fill in the lines on that a little bit. Tell us about your creative life. <sighs> well, um, ever since I, well, before I could talk, I was singing songs and making up little ditties around the house. And when I was 11, I got to the point where I turned to my mom and I said, that's it. I'm doing music for the rest of my life. And she said, awesome, let's do it. So then after that point, you know, every day after school, I'd come home and she, you know, she was never this mother who was like, do your homework and blah, blah, blah. She was always like, go down to the basement and uh, work on some music. And so uh, we, it, it was something that was big in our family throughout all because my father was always a musician and always played songs around the house. And my mother was the other side. She was always the visual artist and into painting and wood burning and things like that. So um, between the ages of 18 and 25, I lived in LA off and on between LA and Ontario, Canada, and uh, recorded and wrote with up and coming artists and producers and things of that like. And it was really, really great. But when I was 25, I had an experience that made me realize I don't want to do this anymore. Like I want to still make music, but I don't want to go to LA. And this was before I really started delving into like, you know, LA and Holly weird and all that stuff. <laughs> you know? And uh, it was just something that it, it came to a, a perfect organic culmination essentially where I was just like, yeah, this is the time I want to stay in Ontario for now. And I want to make music myself and try to release it independently. And, uh, I, the expression part of it is it has always essentially been really, really good. You know, financial, not so much. But <laughs> yeah. as long as you get to express yourself, I mean, that's kind of the only thing that I feel alive doing is, is creating. And Frank, while we're having this conversation, I'm knitting leggings at the same time. You know, like it's, it's just a constant <laughs> thing for me. Like I can't watch a TV show Crazy without drawing or knitting. You know? through, your, through your fingers. My fingertips. Yeah. Like, always and I, I guess maybe that's where I put all my nervous energy and I know definitely with music because I channel what I do and, and same with when I, I'm drawing I channel what I'm doing um, it it just it flows through me and it helps to release 
so much unnecessary junk that I just don't need in yeah. my body and in my aura and everything. And uh, I, I hope that was concise enough. I kind of just it, it. it gives us <laughs> kind, of a, kind of a window into yeah. your creative side. You, yeah. you know, this is actually, I don't think right now, except for major labels, anybody's making a lot of music and money at music yeah. unless they're touring. Yeah. But the exciting thing and what happened as the digital revolution came forward was the software and technology that enabled musicians for the first time to have at their fingertips. Yeah. I, you know, I remember large recording studios. I, I, I had a friend, I grew up around um, musicians and I play guitar. I play a little bit of keyboards, bass and I had the privilege to hang out with people who were producing records when I was growing up in the 60s and 70s. And I remember going to Sigma Sound in Philadelphia, which is where David Bowie recorded parts of Young Americans. Nice. And seeing this huge professional recording studio with what at that time was probably a multi-track, probably eight tracks, huge desks, you know, ISO <laughs> yeah. chambers and mics all over the place and watching as, as a producer was mixing down an LP. And then fast forward into the late 90s, but especially into the 2000s, all of a sudden in the box, we are able to begin doing multi-tracking. I have over here to my right, yeah. um, you can't see it because it's, it's off, off camera, I have a TIAC Tascam that I used years ago. It's a four-track cassette. Nice. And that was like the, you know, Bruce, Springs, Bruce Springsteen recorded in Nebraska with one of these things. That's awesome, eh? Um, but they've given us the ability now to multi-track and with MIDI and virtual synthesizer technology, we have the ability to access in the box all these instruments, all these tracks, unlimited pretty much, yeah. and to be able to do... What effectively was at one time very much a rich man's game of being able to produce an album standalone, sure. which, is, which is what you're doing. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, that is really funny because when I was growing up, it was, we had an, an eight-track Fostex system in those. the basement yeah. with like this crappy little like Yamaha keyboard or whatever. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, it is really amazing because now... I, I work in Pro Tools and I just have like a MacBook and, and an mm -hmm. Mbox and you're fine. You're good to go. You don't have to have, and it fits, like my studio is this teeny tiny little space that essentially just holds me and that's all you need. Like when you mentioned these giant motherboards and soundboards, you know, oh, and it's right. like, it, it's just totally unnecessary to, I mean, it's great if you have a big studio and, and that's what you're doing and that's awesome. But I love that people can have these digital audio workstations like in a closet, you know, <laughs> which is how most voiceover artists I know just do, how, do their work, you know, just find a closet, clean it out and just put everything in there and go to work. But if you look so, at the artists that emerged out of that revolution, I mean, especially in the 2000s with all the indie rock artists, it's a great time to so, be creating. And I think, yeah. you know, however dark all of this technology can be, yeah. uh, I've looked at it as a positive and kind of pushed back against it being co-opted, which it is. Yeah. But we still have the tools of our times. I mean, yeah. if you were Michelangelo, you took a commission from the Vatican to do the Sistine Chapel because that was how you got your art out then. You know, we went yeah. through the patron system of the medieval uh, Renaissance period where artists were beholden to the nobles to be able to create. And modern capitalism kind of placed it into the marketplace. And no sooner do we find our wings than somebody finds a way to control the creative impulse. And yet the creative mm -hmm. impulse wants to be free. Yeah. Yeah, so, I couldn't agree more. <laughs> <laughs> you, you create music from your, from your heart and your spirit. Um, tell me a little bit about the creative process in terms of how you go about this, whether it's art or music or any of the other things you do. What, what, what makes you want to create? I, to be honest, I actually don't really know. It's, it's just, an impulse. 
Yeah, it's it's always been inherent in, yeah. in who I am. Like in my brain, when I think Holly, I think creator, you know, yeah. and and I don't even know where it comes from. It's my deeper self channeling and, and I don't know. I, I think I think it's always been um, a healing mechanism for me. You know, I because I, I was always very, very different. I didn't really have friends. And, and to this day, of course, you know, same sort of thing. I didn't really have friends. I didn't really wasn't interested in parties. You know, when I was 14, I was in the studio recording my first album. And when I was 11, I was in studios recording people's demos for them and, you know, making a hundred bucks here and there. Like I wasn't in that same mentality as everybody else my age. Like, whoa, did you catch that thing last night on TV? And I was like, no, I was in the studio, you know, like <laughs> creating music with, you know, 40 and 50 year olds and my family. And, you know, so it was never, I never fit into any of that. You know, I never joined any groups or did any after school things or anything. It was always me by myself focusing on my music and, and my art and, and writing. And I think the creative process itself, if you want to know like the creative process and to actually like my most recent album, Journey to the Center, did you want to know yes, absolutely, yeah. what the linear? Okay. So I think initially, well, what happened is back in 2007, I released my second album and right after I released it on um, Elements, right after I released it, I was like, I'm going to start writing immediately for the next one. So I started writing for this thing that I envisioned to be this giant thing, this two disc album um, called Beacon, because I always felt like that's what I want to do is to be a beacon for others. Um, the lighthouse essentially, you know, that people can go to yeah. to find comfort or to be inspired or whatever. And um, the more so that I went on with that idea of that album, the more I realized it was more about I'd rather shine my light and then hopefully that will set an example and then others will shine their light and, and not be fearful to do so. And I, I envisioned it this big, like 36 track album with, you know, like uh, kind of like, Darren Hayes' This Delicate Thing We've Made or or Hounds of Love by Kate Bush, you know, the, uh -huh. or not Hounds of Love, sorry, uh, Ariel by Kate Bush. Yeah. Um, so I envisioned that I really wanted to do that. I wanted to create like this almost anthology that tells a story, you know, about like E.T. contact and finding the self and all this other stuff. And, and um, I split it up essentially between three different me's, the inner child, the um, Holly me, and the uh multi-dimensional multi-fractal you know deeper more alien-esque sort of version of me sort of idea so the whole thing the whole album itself was an idea of um a conversation between these three points and how they could build together and how they could learn from each other and how they could all grow and then as time went on it just in the last like year i was like i don't want to do it that way anymore that doesn't feel right because I had been working on it since 2007 and I, I released it 2018. So there was this huge bout of, of growth and change. And I went through my experience, my, my releasing Candida experience and releasing pretty well everything else at the same time. And um, I was just like, that's not me anymore. That's not, that's not the message that I wish to convey. So when it came to Journey to the Center, it was actually originally this other idea. And then around 2015, I started implementing the, the songs that you'll, you hear now when you listen to the actual album. And that, um, the process to that is pretty simple. It's usually, I usually hear the music first. And then I'll just start arranging it in GarageBand and try to connect with it. And then as I'm listening to, as I'm actually setting down notes, lyrics are coming because mm -hmm. I, I really do just, this stuff just literally comes out. And it was very different, very, very different from the experience in LA, you know, sitting in a room trying to write lyrics with somebody else when they're not channeling the lyrics, they're thinking so much about the lyrics. And I'm just like, well, why don't we say this? And it's like, oh, well, let's sit here and think about this for half an hour <laughs> when it's like, but I can write a song in like four minutes. So like, come on, you know, so it's a very different experience. So um, when it came to Journey to the Center, it's, it, it tended to be the music first. And then I would, I would implement that. And as I was putting that in place, then I would start to hear the words and I would start to hear the vocal melodies and I, you know, 
And then once that is ready, you take all of that into the studio and you put it into Pro Tools and you make a nice music mix and just start recording vocals. And, um, and I, there, also, there is someone else in my process and it's my music partner, Matthew Demerit, who was actually in E.T., <laughs> I have to say he played ET in the kitchen scene because he was born without legs. Oh wow. And yeah, and when he was he's in California when he was really young, um like 9, 10, 11 years old, he uh was doing some some like strange movies like this. He did a couple of the weird movies which I I can't actually remember at the moment, but it was really strange like sci-fi horror 1980s films, you know. And um he did a few of those, but he played ET in the kitchen scene where he falls over drunk. <laughs> so that's pretty cool. Um, but yeah, my, my partner, Matthew, so after I would record all of the vocals and everything, I would send it his way and he would add all these extra like beautiful colors on top to tie things together a little bit better um, and uh, mix it down. And he also mastered it for me too. Like I, I, he's, he and I have been partners since like 2008. We met online and we just immediately, it was like just immediate clickage, right? <laughs> you know, where it's like, yeah. we have to make music together. We just have to do it. And then um, in 2012, we released our first album, Being Sound, Volume One, um, which is similar to Journey to the Center, but but more like rock, progressively rock-ish <coughs> sort of feeling. But anyway, so uh, that's essentially when it comes to the album process that's essentially it i hope i wasn't too yeah <laughs> that's all that all that all that energy that i have you know just kind of <laughs> oh i can't hear you yeah no I, i'm a person that's okay. deeply interested in the creative process mm -hmm. the background of what goes on with it what inspires people and the process itself because yeah. it's vastly different you know for everybody that that does this. Um, I've tended to work more in the area of guitar. Uh, I play a little bit of keyboard. And for me, picking up a guitar almost instantly means that I'm all over the neck and I'm working and I'm hearing sounds. And if I write, I write from the sounds that I hear in the guitar. But yes. I also have written backwards where because I'm, I write lyrics and poetry, mm -hmm. I will write a song to a set of lyrics. I'll do that. And you know, someday maybe I'll release some of this stuff. I actually have some of it on SoundCloud under another name, but... Nice. you have to tell me later. <laughs> yeah, well, no, and some of the people who are patrons who got flash drives got some, some of that music. Awesome. Um, but the creative impulse and the ability to put something outside of yourself, to me, is almost as mystical a process as giving birth in some ways. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would call my songs, my babies for sure. Yeah, yeah. You really do feel this, this like ethereal and, and emotional attachment to them. You're like, if I listen to any one of my songs, I can feel, I can actually remember for most of my songs when I'm listening, like how I recorded it and like what was going on in my life at the time that I was recording it, you know, and, and who was at my house at that moment while I was recording it, you know, it's just this, it's like mm -hmm. each one carries yeah. the frequency with it, with which you created it. So when you listen back to it, you pick that up again, right? Yeah. And I think what we'll do maybe when we segue out of, out of this segment, we'll mm -hmm. play a little bit of journey to the center. Cause I told okay. you that was one of my favorites off of the album. So Nice. Um, with your gracious permission, we will do that. No, nope, no, nope, not allowed. Unacceptable. <laughs> <laughs> but of course, Randy. I, I, I take any opportunity I can get to, to, to put music in the shows because yeah. we're sort of constrained by copyright laws. And especially when we go onto YouTube, yeah. it's like an instant slam anytime we use commercial music, which... Yes. I, I, could do a, I could do a soapbox on this because I'm kind of like, you know, that music means a lot to us mm -hmm. that we grow up with. It influenced us. And it's put out there into the public realm. And I understand the need for intellectual rights and I, I'm in favor of it. Yeah. But at the same time, I'm kind of frustrated by the fact that 
we can't afford to pay like ASCAP or BMI or CSAC or any of the other organizations. Yeah. We don't, we're not making money off of putting this out on the public side. So a long ago, I vowed that when I find independent artists, I try to secure permission and put their music Wonderful. out there because I think it's a win-win yeah. to be able to do that. Music should be shared, you know? You were, I mean, the artist needs something, obviously, financially, yeah. but at the same time, the spirit of music is all about unity and, and sharing and inspiring each well, other. Well, we're in the middle of a revolution. Ideas, right? Yeah. You know, we're I in the middle so. of a revolution right now. And I think publishing is going to be the last thing to change, but in some ways, I think we're, we're, we're sort of struggling towards it right now, the balance. Yeah. And truthfully, it is really about supporting artists, buying music that you love. Yeah. Which you're on Bandcamp, so mm -hmm. you know that how important that is for people to go there. And we're going to put all your links up with this show so people will be able to find your, your work you. there as well as your other work. Mm -hmm. um, artists are interesting people because they come from places of extremities. And you have a background and a story you also, in addition to all these other things we've just mentioned, have begun to blog, mm -hmm. and, and you, you put up your most recent blog. Tell people what the name of that blog is, please. Well, I really love alliteration. So, a betterbalanceblog.blogspot.com. And it's just one entry so far, but it, right. it's, it's the, it was like the most important thing. I've been hanging on to that story for five years, and, and just in the last couple of weeks I've been like it's time time to tell that story I, like I want to be able to help somebody you know even if even one person if it is just one person and everyone else is like you crazy girl then whatever that's good <laughs> this is a story about your struggle with a number of health issues that go back to childhood oh yeah that any one of the issues that you experienced is devastating and you fought your way out of it and you did it in a way that kind of derailed the medical system, at least on a Heck personal yes. level. Yeah. Um, yeah. Let's talk about that a little bit, what you struggled with and how you fought back against what your own body was, how it was impacting you. Yeah, well, Candida is a hell of a drug. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. Um, when I was growing up, like the, what we had in the house was all these brand name crappy foods, you know, like filled to the hilt with sugar and yeast and, and colorings and, yeah. you know, all of that stuff. And, and because I, I had this, these, obviously these issues from a very young age, when I was 11, I started gaining weight. And that was the same time that um, I was starting to make music. And so you would start to get used to this, uh, this thing that record companies would say, you know, like, oh, beautiful face, you know, oh, she's so talented. But then the last thing, we'll sign her, but only if she loses weight. And we, which is like so, um, it, it's so demeaning for somebody who's just trying to figure out who they are. And, and, and here I am at 11 years old and I'm like, I don't want to make music to be sexy or be some image or whatever. I want to make music because, because that's just who I am. You know, that's what I think my gift is for the world. You know, that my way of trying to inspire others and trying to create a better frequency here, you know, not so much of all the horrific stuff that we tend to see. Right. And, um, you know, that was something that held me back. Well, I say that, held me back but it didn't really hold me back it was a positive thing but at the time you know having that extra weight um i realize now to a certain degree because everything is so multi-dimensional and multi-fractal that you know it was almost like the future me was saying like keep the weight on you don't want to be a part of this <laughs> you don't want to be in that world you know yeah. and and only when i was much much older did i realize that and um to make a long story short for this segment um, when I was 32, I had a horrific experience that started, um, it was ultimately a six, seven month experience, but I felt the pain for two years off and on, um, which started with the yeast infection, which seems 
innocuous enough, right? If you don't know anything about whatever. But, you know, the fact that there's a yeast infection or, or candidiasis or whoever you pronounce it or thrush or whatever, that means everything is totally off. That means everything is in a state of disarray. And, and at that point when I was 32, you know, I was 320 pounds. I'm only 5'2". Um, I had horrible skin issues all over my face. Like um, I would get like, like reptilian scales all over this area. And um, when I'd have showers, I would use really hot water and I would scratch it off. And sometimes it would bleed and it would secrete poison and like all this other stuff. And it would be painful. If it wasn't itchy, it was painful. Um, my thyroid didn't work. My periods were coming once every five, six months, you know, like just really insane stuff. And I, it wasn't that I wasn't trying to lose weight. You know, I, I wasn't on some crazy regimen or on a diet or whatever, but I was trying, you know, I said at one point, like, we got to stop buying pop. So it had been a thing. I, I had loved Dr. Pepper way, way, way back in the day. So we would go maybe like once a week and buy like a, a case of like 24 Dr. Pepper cans or whatever. And I said, we have to stop to my husband. We have to stop doing this. I need, we need to improve. And around the same time he stopped buying beer, you know, cause he was buying a two, four beer every week and that was his thing. And so we work together. I've always had an incredible ally in, in, I have an amazing husband who's my best friend, my hero. And, and we have a very strange connection <laughs> as well. We met when we were five. And so we've known each other for over 32 years. And wow. when we, when we met when we were five in, in kindergarten, I was just like, I know you, you know, it's just an automatic, like, this is, this is one of my people. Soul connection. This is the most important. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and I always felt like we went through many, many lives together, um, supporting each other, that there was unconditional love and support. And uh, it, so it's, it's very magical, the weird thing that we have, like to the extent where sometimes, and it happens all the time, we start singing songs randomly at the exact same time in the exact same spot of the song. And then we'll turn to each other and be like, <laughs> right? so I, I have my own theories on what that is like I, I think outside of this construct we're together and maybe at one point we were one entity or something of that nature that split into two because it, that's the only thing that makes any sense to me you know considering this weird connection we have but um, oh, I just totally went off track so yeah I, I had this horrible experience where I ended up living in the bathtub for six months and, and it turned off everything in my life other than living in the bathtub and because that was the only thing that would relieve any sort of pain and thankfully through this whole process i killed off all the candida and uh i was like oh, i'm trying not to get like emotional about it because it is one of the greatest things that's ever happened to me and that sounds so weird like if you had seen what i'd gone through like literally screaming at the i screamed so much for and and cried so much and i was convulsing my, my pelvis would constantly convulse and it would happen for hours and hours and hours and hours and i was awake all night long i wasn't sleeping i wasn't eating for weeks and um which now i'm kind of seeing is like oh well that was kind of like a, a lengthy dry fast you know maybe that was exactly what i need and and i think what happened in the bathtub it was an, an incredible turning point for me because all the issues I had before are gone and now I'm half the weight that I was and, and just crazy things like that. Like the inflammation in my feet was so bad that once I left the bathtub and it was gone, I had dropped a foot and a half in shoe size. Oh, wow. And I didn't think that that was possible. You know, you don't think about that, but I used to have big puffy hands that were like catcher's mitts and just always everything's inflamed. My face was always puffy and big and weird and it was just unbelievable but I wouldn't change anything for what happened and and I know that I created that for myself because well this it also ties into where we live Salt Spring Island BC which is this strange magical little island that I would definitely say is a pocket universe of some sort and um <laughs> yeah. yeah and the minute the minute that Eric and I turned to each other on on an incredibly hot, hot, hot summer Ontario day. And I turned to him and I said, 
okay, so we're moving, right? We're going to move to Salt <laughs> Spring because his sister lived here and still does. And he was like, are, are you serious? <laughs> and I'm like, shit, yeah, I'm serious. Like, let's do it, please. And it was that moment where when we just came from our heart space and we said, we're doing this, that everything changed. Everything absolutely changed. And it was the weirdest thing. And, and then I started making money with voiceover. That's when I started voiceover. And I was making money within a couple of weeks, you know, and I was getting jobs regularly. It was like the universe or my deeper self or whatever, some sort of force really wanted me to be able to save the money to make this trip out West to be here. And I actually feel that the bathtub was my initiation to the island. It was kind and, of a spaceship. Yeah. 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 I, I, I definitely know, like, at the state that I was in, there's no way I could have survived life here. Because life here is, a, is an incredibly different, it's such an incredibly different frequency. I, I, I can only almost laugh at it because I, I just, it's so hard to put into words, but this island is like an entity that holds up mirrors for you throughout everything. And you have no choice but to look in the mirror and go, oh, okay, that's where I'm messing up. Well, I'm going to deal with it. You know, the challenges we've had in the last four and a half years just on this island are, are way a lot more than any of the other challenges we've ever had. And, um, and I feel like the bathtub was like this key shift for me because I didn't just get rid of candida and parasites. I also got rid of, <laughs> sorry, I don't know if you heard my cat, Charlie. She just went. Bruh. I heard um, a rooster earlier. <laughs> oh, nice. We have three of those. <laughs> yeah, that, that's awesome. Love having um, roosters in the background. Oh, it's, it's wonderful to hear them singing all day. It makes me so happy. I'm such a happy chicken mama and grandma. You have no idea. But um, I feel like the bathtub was like, um, I didn't just get rid of these biological issues and physical issues. I cleansed demons. I, yeah. I literally felt like I was in the pits of my own personal hell. And I could feel myself like climbing out of this while while freaking demons are grabbing my ankles and trying to pull me back down and I'm saying hell no it's not happening it's not happening I'm getting out of here I'm, I'm succeeding you know and um wow it's, but the, the baths the, the, the baths <laughs> you were in um those were salt baths, correct? Yes, Epsom salt and tea yeah. tree. And then I would apply, well, my husband would apply for me tons of coconut oil to the affected area. And um, yeah. Yeah, I'm actually, it's funny that you brought this up when I read the article, my jaw dropped. Um, I'm dealing with my own health issues. Yeah. And one of my modalities has been, I'm only doing it twice weekly, taking a very long Epsom salts and nice. along with some essential oils and other things that my dear life partner wife <laughs> has put together for me because she's made it her personal mission to make sure I don't fucking die on her. Yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, it's it's a good know, mission. Yeah, not that bad. I mean, <laughs> this year has 2018 has been like this gigantic yawning chasm that I had to go through on like yep. multiple levels at once. And the health thing, I never thought of myself as unhealthy. But yeah. we reach points where things catch up with us. You yes. Know, the unhealthy aspects of ourselves, whether they're internal or external. Yeah. And it was, you know, in some ways I wish Emily was on the call today because um, this is really her thing, candida yeah. and sugar yeah. and, and, and self-healing. So, Em, you're not here, but you are in spirit, and I'll try to do this Absolutely. justice. Because it was Emily that, that, that started to point me in a certain direction, and my wife was picking up on it too, that um, we think of candida as largely a female malady, mm -hmm. and obviously it affects females in a certain way because you're, of your biology. Yes. But it's not limited to females. Um, no. When I began to, and, and you know, Emily is extreme about sugar, and I've, I've lovingly called her the sugar Nazi a couple of times because <laughs> she is brutal about this, but yeah. she's absolutely right. Yeah. Once we begin to eliminate what is basically a commercially manufactured toxin yeah. in all its forms, and it's hard. I mean, getting it, it sugar, really 
Getting sugar out of your life is hard because it means giving up almost all commercial products that we love. Yeah. Um, I haven't, I haven't, I haven't drank soda on any level, pretty much ever. I mean, yeah. as a kid, we were fed obviously the same things like you. I mean, Coca Cola was always there. Candy bars from the nice people at Hershey's and M and M Mars. Um, we binged on it. And, yeah, I, and yes. I have to say, one yes. of my addictions <laughs> wasn't that. It was these sour gummy worms that you buy. Oh, I, yeah. And I realized one day that I literally would get drunk off of them. I don't really drink yeah. alcohol. I mean, occasionally a glass of wine or a beer. But I would get drunk off of the gummy worms. And I'm like, totally. it's the strangest thing in the world. And then mm. I thought about it and I realized that Alcohol metabolizes to sugar, yep. hence why it ta will take out your liver, your pancreas, and that <clears throat> I was stressing my own system, even with what I considered to be a fairly balanced, healthy diet, I was still had enough sugar intake that it was imbalancing. Yeah, yeah. and once you have the candida, until you cleanse it completely, yeah. it, it just keeps compounding upon itself. And, and after the bathtub, um, I, I was literally at the, uh, at the six month mark, I was still in the bathtub, but I wasn't screaming anymore and I wasn't crying as much. And I was doing a lot more deep breathing and vaping cannabis a lot. And, and yeah. it was time where we had to go, we had to drive across the country. And, and that was, that was kind of insane. What was I going to say? The, um, Oh, there's so much to this topic, you know. No, please and, go and, ahead. Just, just free. <laughs> well, well, something I was going to say is um, there is an appreciation for natural sugars that happens afterwards too, because from just the end of December 2013 until July 2014, when we finally lived here. Um, I had zero sugar of any kind, not even the natural kind. I didn't have a piece of fruit. I was literally eating salads with like nothing on them and like, or a little bit of like organic olive oil, but that was it, mm. you know, and um, cruciferous vegetables because they're amazing to help cleanse candida, broccoli and, and, and yeah. cauliflower and cabbage. And, and, and now my favorite food, like almost of all time is raw Brussels sprouts. I put them on everything. <laughs> They're just so healing and amazing. These little teeny tiny things that pack so much amazing stuff in them. And I just feel so good having them. But in July, 2014, we were in Victoria with uh, Eric's sister and her kid and her, her ex-husband. And uh, she had, she had brought some organic strawberries and she was like, do you want one? And I had at this point, no sugar for, for like seven, eight months. And I was like, well, seven months. And I was like, uh, I don't know, should I, should I, should I? Because like, I was so afraid that if I ate one slice of strawberry, I'd be in a bathtub again. So then, and we don't have a bathtub at our new house on Salt Springs. So it was kind of like, I can't let that happen. And, and I said, yeah, yeah, okay. I, I think it'll be okay. You know, after I thought about it for a minute. And I ate this strawberry and Randy, <laughs> it was the most delicious strawberry, the most delicious piece of fruit I have ever had. So I, I think another aspect to this healing was also when I could start eating apples and strawberries again, I had this newfound respect and appreciation for these natural little sugars. And um, yeah, it's just like everything. It's multidimensional, eh? It's multidimensional. And yeah. every person has to really come to know their own bio biology, their own body. Yeah. yeah. Um, it wouldn't seem obvious to anyone that I had any nutritional issues except for the fact that I've been consistently very thin. Yeah. But I had to change my diet because hidden in the background there is hypoglycemia, which, you know, I was diagnosed with as a teenager. No. I never had the problems with weight or anything like that has been the reverse of that. But the sugar itself was an agent that was working in the background to trigger my lifelong depression. And uh -huh. I never realized yes. it. No, I didn't <laughs> put those things together that when you're depressed, eating is, is an outlet. Some people yeah. drink, some people use drugs, some people... Yeah have recreational excessive amounts of sex or something like that, I sort of 
drugged myself with sugar and yeah, didn't realize it. And as I have gone through the years and the depression has to be dealt with, then, you know, it came time to deal with it on a serious level, which meant I had to look honestly at my own diet and realize that my excessive use of sugar was something that I had to get control of if I was going to yeah. control my moods, if I was going to deal yeah. with these, these shifts in, in, in my moods. And while I appreciate the fact that there are people out there that do this work, you know, there is a balance in all of this. And, yeah. you know, Emily Moyer would be the first person to tell you that she herself takes a day when she isn't strict with herself. Yep. Because we're human beings and we want to enjoy the good things in life. And there's, yeah. there's balance in all of this. So the, the, go ahead. That, well, I was just going to say that's, that's so huge to what my husband and I have come to in, in our goals and in our life is finding the balance. Mm. Because pre the bathtub, it was excess. You know, like I would literally walk the two blocks to the Tim Hortons around, around the corner from our house to get a dozen donuts and then, you know, walk home. Very hard to do, by the way, when you're like 300 pounds, but <laughs> walk home and then eat like six of them without even thinking, yeah. you know? And then, well, maybe I should stop, but I still wanted more. I, it, you know, it was so excessive and my childhood as well with the way the food was in our house. And, um, and which doesn't say anything about my mother because she was always very good about home making a lot of meals, you know, but it was all the extra stuff, you know, it was the old Henry ice cream in the freezer that was always there. And, you know, the Ruffles chips that were always there. And, um, and then the bathtub and post bathtub, there was a two, three year period where I was almost the other way, where I was like, none whatsoever. It's not happening. No sugar, no yeast, no, no glyphosate, no GMO, blah, 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 blah. And for the most part, I, I still adhere to that. But now I find it where it's like, Balance. Like 95% of the time, I prepare our own food, usually from our own organic garden, you know, and because um, we have a, a, a lovely like 30 by 40 or 30 by 50 garden, and it's wonderful. And, um, you know, I prepare my own food and, you know, like I make us homemade soups and, and I try to make everything the highest quality. Like every meal, we eat organic flax seeds, organic hemp seeds, organic chia seeds, you know, like we, we try to make this amazing balance between veggies and nuts and seeds. And, and, um, but once in a while, like last night we were feeling like, well, let's celebrate life a little bit. So we went to one of our favorite places on the Island and got a pizza and enjoyed that. And, but eating habits surrounding that have totally changed too, because, you know, back in my excess days, we would call Pizza Hut and we would order two large stuffed crusts and we would get like three different kinds of boneless wings and we'd buy a two liter pop. Like it was so beyond excessive. And now I can eat two pieces of pizza before I'm completely full and feel mm. like I'm going to barf. <laughs> like yeah. This is too much food. And, and so that was another thing that, that happened from that cleanse was until you've had that experience of this this bacteria in your body literally controlling your mind. And that doesn't mean that I don't take responsibility for go al going along with, oh, yeah, I'll grab this other chocolate bar because I totally do. But when you have this entity of candida, which I would say is a nanotech, <clears throat> my own personal whatever, like it literally controls your mind. You know, you finish six donuts and it tells you, Psst, hey, you you want to go get that bag of chips over there. You know, why eat that up? Just might as well. And and you do it. And then afterwards, it's like, Psst, hey, there's more chocolate in the fridge. You know, why don't you go and... Uh, and it's it's like this... It, it's like this incredible, horrible spiral, you know? And, um, and then once you get rid of it, Randy, it's like that voice in my head has been gone now for five years. And it's the most liberating thing. Because now when I say, you know what? It's been a couple of months. Let's go to the bakery and let's let's get a cupcake and or split an apple fritter. You know, it's no one is telling me to do that. It's literally Holly or the deeper Holly saying, "Let's go have one of these treats." You know, and the rest of the yeah. time it's like, "Okay, what we can what can we do to uh, stay balanced?" And and we're constantly measuring that too. Like, "Oh no, we had pizza last night, so today." Let's be really smart about it. Let's just stick with fruits and veg and, and, and nuts and seeds and that sort of thing. So 
this is why I called my blog a better balance blog because I, I realized throughout this process that what I've been looking for is a better balance because I grew up in, in this excessive environment um, and, and it wasn't just excessive food, you know, it was excessive so many other things, like the way we all lived our lives, the four of us. And um, it, it was never right for me. It was never good for me. And now I'm in this place that has its own energy and, and its own, it's so hard to explain, you know, this, this incredible island covered in quartz, like everywhere you go. So there's this healing energy yeah. just vibrating yeah. everywhere, you know, and, and I'm just constantly striving for better balance. You know, like I did it this way yesterday. I can do it better today. I'm going to do it better today, you know? And so I'm constantly trying to improve and build on the improvements before and, and that's so freeing. That's so freeing, you know, and to not have that little weird voice in my head telling me to go eat terrible things. And, <laughs> and I couldn't, you couldn't pay me to eat some of the stuff, most of the stuff that I used to eat. You couldn't pay me a million dollars. Like, no. well, it really is <laughs> interesting that you viewed it, viewed it that way, that what Emily calls sugar as programmable matter or this mm -hmm. alien entity that lives inside of you that seems to yeah. take command and control of your appetite, your neurological structure and, and your organs, all of that is, it's scary. And, and yeah. it's stealthed into us in the age of commercial food production. Yeah, advertising. You know, um, advertising. You want this thing. Yeah. We grew up in it. We grew up in the generations after the family farm where we detached the act of planting seeds and cultivating soil yeah. and, you know, livestock and all of that. We've, we've divorced ourselves from the source of all of this. And in the process, what stepped in was agribusiness, which dumps sugar and excessive amounts of sodium. And I make yeah. the distinction there in everything. salt, which is actually yeah. very useful, as opposed to the sodium, along with all of the other chemicals that they've dumped into the system, hence into our body, and how we ourselves are being terraformed as human yeah. beings. Absolutely. And, yeah. and how most people won't ever put the two together. You know, it'd just be 50 and be like, oh, I just got diagnosed with cancer. Okay, well, I don't know what caused that, you know, because, you know, cancer, some random, whatever. Meanwhile, it was the 50 years leading up to that, you know, all the excessive you. everything, you know, it just, it all compounds over time. And um, I'm, I'm so grateful for what I went through because it, it's completely changed me as a person. I mean, another aspect was before that I was definitely a truther, you know, in, in the beginning of 2008, I I saw zeitgeist and yeah. I had already had all of these awakenings throughout my life. I'd never bought into religion, was never brought up in it. Thankfully, thank you, my parents, you know, and whereas my husband, it was way excessive the other way. And, um, you know, we were never like really, my parents were never really like people who voted and things like that. Like we didn't get involved in all of that stuff. We, the four of us were always kind of the black sheeps and then I was the extra big black sheep of everybody. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> so yeah, let's be honest. So, um, it was, um, oh, I forget what I was going to say now. Well, that happens. It happens. Yeah, it does. It'll come if it's meant to come. Yeah. Yeah. We kind of, we kind of rounded off our first segment for this. Yeah, but, okay. Um, once again, let's tell people where they can find Holly Linden on the internet for your various endeavors so many places now um <laughs> you can go to hollylindenspire.net um i also have a society six which is just society6.com slash hollylinden my blog is a better balance blog blogspot.com uh you can find my music on hollylinden.bandcamp.com and my latest album journey to the center is there and i also have an etsy but and I'm on Twitter and Facebook and, and all of that. Um, I got sucked back in recently. So, uh, but Holly Lind Inspire is probably the best place because that's where I post everything in my okay. voiceover works. and it's and kind of essential. Like yeah, yeah, and then we didn't talk book. about the Mandela Coloring book either, but maybe we can just okay. give that a, a mention here because that is an interesting 
concept in itself. <laughs> Coloring books yeah. have become, uh, I actually have started doing things like this and along with folk art doing coloring books and sketchbooks as part of therapy. It's just yeah. a way to detach from the conscious mind process and begin yeah. to reconnect with that whole gestalt that is the creative process. And oh, yeah. I'll it puts you in the zone. Yeah. So there's the Mandela coloring book. All the links will be up with this. And uh, we're going to take you out with Journey to the Center from Holly Linden's album, Journey to the Center. And if you're a Patreon member, you'll get that deft segue into the next segment where we're going to go deep. And if not, why not? Join us at <laughs> patreon.com forward slash off planet media. And the website is off planet radio.com. I'm Randy Moggins. And, uh, We'll be back for some of you and for others. Come and join us. Somebody